Well, Jake was on a lot of TV this week, but Jake's entire family was on the Dark Side of the Ring episode and appropriately titled In the Shadow of Grizzly Smith. And this, whew, this was a program. Um, it was, I thought, very well done. At the same time, hard to watch for most everybody. And at the same time, I think they have succeeded with this one in establishing the balance that they go for in that it's a documentary series about things that, or people in wrestling and the wrestling industry, but it's a program that they want to appeal to non-wrestling fans because of the story. It just happens to be people involved in wrestling in a lot of cases, but this one was the least wrestling content and one of the most riveting to watch at the same time. And for wrestling fans in general, I'm sure that most people had no idea of this story unless they had seen what a bit of beyond the mat, unless they'd seen some of Jake's shoot interviews. Robin we knew, talked about it. Robin talked about it a few years ago in an interview. I was about to say, yeah, Howard Brody did his book and and Howard and Robin are have been friends for quite some time and and Howard had mentioned some things that she had allowed him to mention in his book and it said but it's come out in different places in different ways and over the last what it's been 20 years since Beyond the Mat which I think was maybe the first time any of this was spoken about for public consumption, I don't know. But anyway. It was the first time I had heard much of it. And well, and see, that this is the thing. Let me preface this talk of the Dark Side of the Ring episode. A lot of people, I don't know whether it was the fault of the program, the way that it was presented, whether it was the fault of all the people, myself included, who were speaking, or whether it was the fault of the cognitive functioning of some people who have watched it or whatever but a ton of people were tweeting well they turned a blind eye to this guy and worked with him or as somebody even said well Cornette said that joey ryan and that star guy in england all the rest of them turned out to be weasels showing that the guys today are even worse than some of the guys in the old days well what about this let me just make this statement at the start so that we can move on with a intelligent discussion. We all turned a blind eye to Grizzly and worked with him like all the co-workers in Jeffrey Dahmer's candy factory turned a blind eye and worked with him because they didn't know he was fucking eating people at the time. And this is what drove me crazy about some of these people couldn't get this picture People didn't know all of this shit was taking place at the time it was taking place. And as you just mentioned, over the last 20 years, and especially after Grizzly's been dead, more of it has been told. Jake has probably told more of it than anybody else, but now you have heard Robin, and you've heard a bit of, you know, other people's, statements baby doll even mentioned when she got with sam and i know that it was when sam houston and baby doll got together it was 85 in charlotte and then by 87 they were gone and did and sam houston went to the uwf and dolls from texas i'm uh, uh, that was when they were still together so i'm assuming that that would have been when they were riding around with grizzly and that's what Dahl said that gets to the root of the matter. It was weird and it was strange and you would look, but you couldn't find anything. You didn't see anything. So I think that we, we have to discuss a little bit of who Grizzly was, how he presented himself and how he was presented. And it was especially I mentioned, and uh, I think on last week's program, at the time that I was in Mid South Wrestling, he would have been in his early fifties. And I don't know whether he was doing the things at that point that he had always done, 
but you you didn't see it, but there was the murmurs and the snickers of people because he was always around the girls at the matches. And at that point, you weren't necessarily looking for whether, well, are they 16 or are they 19 or whatever, because he's a 50-something-year-old, 7-foot-tall, 375-pound man. But he was an authority figure at the same time. He was the road agent for Mid-South Wrestling. He had worked that territory on and off, mostly on, for over 20 years. He knew every road. He knew every building manager. He knew every policeman. He knew every everything. One would have thought, with a guy that was that public and in that many places and a a public figure, that somebody would have known something was wrong, but there's something else that, that Robin indicated in this program and some other people mentioned, and it hit me for the first time watching this show that Grizzly Smith... He he wasn't a graduate of Harvard University. He didn't have PhDs. He wasn't an educated genius, but he had to be probably one of the smartest evil manipulators that and and psychologists. Maybe that's where Jake gets <laughs> well, that is where Jake gets the gimmick. And everything else is is that the way that Grizzly Smith was able to manipulate people and present himself to get the things he wanted to get and to do the things he wanted to do, even mentioned that he withheld affection from his own daughter for like a month around the house, wouldn't ignore her, wouldn't even pay attention to her, and then suddenly, oh, but daddy loves you, and hugged her, and then she said that's the first time that he put his hands on her. He prepped people for the, and he, you talk about people living double lives or two lives. Here's something else. I don't know whether they mentioned this in Dark Side of the Ring, but I think it was in the uh, Beyond the Mat clip with Jake, where he said that Jake's mother was 13 years old at the time that she gave birth to him. And she was married to Grizzly Smith at the time. But she was the daughter of a woman that Grizzly Smith was dating before the kid got pregnant. And then, and this was, Grizzly's born in what, early 1930s? So this was the mid-1950s. This was before Grizzly Smith got in wrestling. And in in that part, in that time, in in those small towns in Texas, 13-year-old girl gets pregnant, well, you better marry her, and then it's okay, as long as they get married. So that's what happened, that Jake's mother was actually the daughter of a woman that Grizzly was seeing. <clears throat> and I don't think that was fully explained in the dark side of the ring, but they were married. Well, then Grizzly gets in wrestling. Well, I can testify that in those days, not in the late 50s, early 60s, but in the 60s and 70s, you didn't know anything more about a wrestler's home life than what he wanted you to know. The guys almost never brought their wives to the buildings, never brought their wives to the shows. In in Charlotte, it started happening when we were doing stadiums or Starcade, and it was a big deal, and, and you brought the wife, and they sat in a special section, and they weren't mixed with the fans because in those days, if you, if you were a heel and brought your wife or girlfriend to the matches, there was a good chance that if you, they couldn't go in the locker room, family wasn't allowed. It was strictly adhered to in those days. They, if they sat out in the arena and had to go to the bathroom, if they had to use the women's room, there was a good probability if the fans knew that you were a heel's wife or girlfriend, some some of the girls were going to catch you and beat shit out of you in the bathroom or start something. Uh, if baby faces, sometimes wives and girlfriends, even worse, because now they're not just mad at the heel and wanting to get their fucking wife, but they're mad at the wife of the baby face because they want the baby face. And people think I'm making this up. Well, you can think that if you want, but no, there's there's been a lot of sticky situations involving the better half of some of the wrestlers just for having to go to the bathroom. So 
a guy like Grizzly Smith with what was going on, it would have not been any problem for anybody in the wrestling business never to have met his wife or seen his home life. And guys traveled so much back then. It, 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 unless that, and he was a controlling individual, so he wasn't probably going to let this girl fucking hang out with the rest of the wives. <clears throat> so you can see that he had two different lives. In, and when he would come to the, uh, the shows in Mid-South, he was the agent. He would usually have one of the underneath preliminary guys driving him because we've told this story before grizzly was going to puerto rico one time early 70s was on a plane landing gear wouldn't come down they had to foam the runway he said i'm never going to get on another plane again if i get off of this one and he didn't until he got a brief job agenting in the 90s and i guess then he flew a few times but in the louisiana territory he was in his car three to 4,000 miles a week. And he made every show. He never took a day off <clears throat> and he would have a, an underneath a preliminary guy, brick house Brown served for a while. Um, Jerry gray on six Oh five talked to Jerry about gray, his experience. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you about that in a second. I'll let you finish what you're okay. saying. Okay. Well, just the, the deal with them would be that you don't pay for any gas. I don't charge you trance. You drive for me. And I, especially on those Oklahoma trips, Grizzly Smith would spend better part of two or three days without getting a hotel room where he would go to a show, drive the next overnight, whatever, go to the next one, because all of those guys would be his driver. But uh, tell me Jerry's story, because he had a lot of guys in the car with him and they saw weird things, as Baby Doll mentioned all of a sudden you'd be 50 miles off the road and he'd be picking up this young girl that her parents were seeing her off and they'd do the loop together, but you never saw anything else. What did Jerry say? Jerry said, and when Jerry was in mid South in early 84, he rode around with different people. He was with you in the express for a brief period of time too. Yeah. He was in different cars. And at some point he ended up riding with Grizzly Jerry, like you just said, working underneath. He said, Grizzly, without saying anything, would just have a girl with him. Yeah. And it would be, and he said the crazy thing was, because I mean, you know, you think back now and you hear stories like that now and you're wondering, why didn't anyone say anything? Why didn't anyone speak up? And it was awkward, he said, but it was also weird because it wasn't like a girl held captive. It was a girl who was treating this guy like he was some loving, trusted uncle or Grandfather, something. Uncle Grizzly. The parents would see them off. So you knew something was off. You felt something was off, but it wasn't being shown to you. It wasn't like he was doing explicit things in front of other people. No, Whatever and there, was would, there would never be a shady remark in front of anyone or a suggestive remark in front of anyone. And that, that's the thing is this guy was such an authority figure and you you got the impression uh, and that's why i was saying a lot of the guys i said in the in the in the dark side clip a lot of the guys behind his back would joke like i wonder if grizzly's mentoring some of the young girls or reading them bible verses because you would see grizzly speaking to all the girls girls traveling with him but you would also see the parents oh yeah you're gonna spend the weekend with uncle grizz it's great uh, because Here's a guy who'd been a big wrestling star in this part of the country for 20 years, who had a responsible position with Mid-South Wrestling that and came to the shows every two weeks or whatever that was there live and dealt with people, and he was able to ingratiate himself with these people to where that they thought, oh, wow. We're we're wrestling fans, and our daughter's a wrestling fan, and she's going to go get to go backstage and meet all the TV stars, and Uncle Grizz is good. That type of thing is going to take her around and take care of her. They had no idea what was going on in this guy's private life, which was, I don't remember ever Grizzly showing up with any type of relative. We knew Jake was his son, right? We 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 never met a wife. We never met parents. We never met other kids. We never met cousins. We never, it was Grizzly 
showing up at the matches with, you know, either himself or a preliminary guy in a car with him, or sometimes one of these young ladies that he was the, you know, fucking uncle of. And you just hit on something I wanted to mention, because I heard from someone, a mutual friend of ours, and he said to me... Don't mention his name, you may change that status. He was watching it before I was, because I was like 20 minutes behind on DVR. And he just said to me, I've lost a lot of respect for Bill Watts. And I thought there was a Bill Watts thing in there, and there wasn't. He meant that nothing was done when everything with the allegations with Robin and Robin's mom having a problem. And that's where it becomes who knew what and when. And you just said his family was never there. You saw some of the photos. I have many more of the photos of little Al Vavasor of backstage. When they saw Robin or Sam, they were sitting on their dad's knee, smiling, happy to be with them. All anyone knew of yeah. Jake was that it was Grizzly's son who wanted to break into the business. All the yeah. stuff now, like I wanted to shove it up my dad's ass. My dad didn't love me. That wasn't what people knew. I mean, Jerry Gray was very close with Jake. He always says Jake was always on the phone with Grizzly, especially when he was helping out with the booking in Georgia, asking for ideas or finishes. And he always relied on Grizzly. You know, and then... You know, well, see, and, and here's another thing. Also, you you mentioned those those pictures of the kids sitting on Grizzly's knee and everything. That was mid '60s. No, con, uh, well, mid '60s no. to early '70s. No, mid '70s. I was would that say. how old were they? That had to be mid '70s. There, Robin looked like she was around ten or eleven, maybe, and Sam maybe a year or two older, right? Well, Sam Houston is is. If he's not my age, he's two years younger. Oh, I'm not so, sure. I didn't think they were that yeah. early based on the other photos they were around. But Well, a, a couple that I saw, and I helped dig up some pictures for this also. Uh, the point is, those kids at the time, if, if Sam Houston was 10 years old, that'd been 1970, 72, whatever, early 70s. Okay, yeah. But if, if as I said, in the mid 80s, you know, it was just, it was grisly. And, you, you know, you knew he lived in Baton Rouge. But I don't know if anybody ever went to his house. Um, you know, it, it was just, there was two lives. The only image we had of Grizzly was as the road agent authority figure. I, again, I have a hard time thinking that if Bill Watts knew what was going on in the family, that this relationship would have continued because they were on the outs at one point just about wrestling. That's when Grizzly went and booked for the outlaw promotion, the Curtis is in, in Mississippi. Yeah, best thing that ever happened. To um, <laughs> well, yeah. And, and then as a matter of fact, as the story goes, Grizzly calls and says, can I please come back? We're making no money here. And Watts turned around and said, I'll send you $500 a week. Keep booking for him because he was a lousy booker. And, and Watts knew that the more, longer Grizzly booked, the worse trouble or the less trouble he'd have with him. So he was paying the opposition's booker to continue booking. But the point, no, no, that wouldn't have flown with Watts. And here's another thing. Who was going to call Bill Watts and say, hey, why does your road agent have Jerry Gray and or this little 11-year-old girl in the car making the loops? Who's going to call the office and stooge on Grizzly? Bill Watts didn't make those towns. Watts went to TV and Oklahoma. So Grizzly had a level of autonomy there. And that's the point. He apparently we're finding out now he was such a manipulative master of psychology to present the image that he wanted to present to people. He's Uncle Grizzly to these people where he's wanting to give their children a thrill by taking them on the road with the big time wrestlers. He's official Grizzly all business and no folder all to the boys. He's the one that finds you for being late or finds you for not dressing professionally or stooge. And that's another reason we've talked about. That's why he talked to all the girls. He knew the names of all of the rats in all the towns, because then he could get the scoop on the boys. And so there was a reason for him theoretically, professionally to be talking to all those girls. But there was also obviously something else potentially going on as well. You know, the other crazy thing, too, is after this point in time, they talked about uh, a little bit about this period in Darkseid, uh, although not fully explained. 
but Robin, Sam, Jake, and Grizzly all work for WWE. So for all yep. these stories we're hearing now, Grizzly still got a job with WWE. After that, he got a job with Turner Broadcasting. I mean, he was working for WCW. Yep. That's Turner. So I mean, the, the last time I saw him in person was at a god damn it at a WCW probably when Watts was there event when when no no it wasn't because I didn't make anything when when we came back for Watts in ninety three um I don't even know if Grizz was was agenting at that point for him or if he just stopped by but it was nineteen ninety and we were in Texas somewhere at a WCW show. And he had already had the little run as an agent for Vince. And maybe he was about to start and I was about to go. I don't know. But I saw him. That's I remember that basically because he told me, well, I've started getting back on airplanes again. So that's why I remember that conversation. But like you said, at the start, Grizzly was so in with the, the Louisiana territory that when his son Jake wants to wrestle, well, yeah, that is, and he's got contacts. And then later on, when Sam Houston and Rock and Robin wanted to wrestle, well, Nelson Royal in the Carolinas, Nelson Royal and Tex McKenzie were a huge team at the same time as the Kentuckians, Grizzly Smith and Luke Brown in North Carolina. And he had that contact. But then later on, when Jake got to be a big star in the WWF, that's how they got Grizzly. Because you, you're you going to tell me that Vince McMahon's going to hire Grizzly Smith just out of the blue. No, one of his top guys, his father needs a job. I think that's how he got that. Well, it was after Watts went out of business or sold his company to Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Grizzly needed a job. Jake is on top up there. They've already brought Robin in, and Sam is Sam's the best worker. He's just paid painfully thin. Um so I think that, you know, Grizz got those last couple of spots because of, you know, who his son was rather than his son at, at getting the start because of his, who his father was. But yes, it, like you said, if anybody had known anything other than Snicker, and, and how many people have been snickered at for their peculiarities in the wrestling business? But if anybody had been had known anything except some snickering and whatever, no, Vince wouldn't have... <laughs> brought him up from scratch and no, then he wouldn't have been working for Turner. People didn't know the extent or not even just the extent, but most of the details at that point in time. And I got to be honest with you. Was it a news story anywhere around wrestling when Jake's other or Grizzly's other daughter got kidnapped and disappeared and murdered, whatever. I heard about that years and years and years later. I heard about that in an interview with Jake. It may have been in the documentary and beyond the mat. Yeah. And and I wasn't in the wrestling business in 1979, but boy, I was sure hooked up to, you know, it would have been smart fans that existed. Yeah, It would have been in a Terry justice newsletter if anyone knew about it. And it wasn't. Yeah. Nobody in, in wrestling knew that's what I'm saying. This guy's life was compartmentalized his personal life and his professional life here. Here was my professional view of Grizzly. You know, he went with me the first time I ever went to jail in my life in little rock, Arkansas. We hadn't been down there long and we were just finding out about the crowds. Right. And at some, at, at a show in little rock, I don't even remember the exact details, but guy took a swing and he, uh, I got away from it and retaliated and he didn't get away from me. And I knocked him fucking goofy and we got out of there and left and drove back home. But the guy went and swore a warrant for assault. So they told Grizzly came up and told me at one of the next shows, well, you're going to have to go turn yourself in in little rock. What? I didn't know that was a thing. I thought if you didn't get arrested on the spot at that point in time, I thought, okay, you've got away with something, right? <laughs> I didn't, I never knew. Well, I'd never been arrested at this point. I never knew that they could say, Hey, you need to come in. <laughs> so he said, you can't wait till the next time we go to little rock because you get there late. By the time they get you over there and process whatever, you'll miss the fucking show. You got to take care of, you got a day off coming up. I had a, I had one day off coming up and he wanted me to drive to little rock, Arkansas, four and a half hours at best, five hours really from Louis, from Alexandria, turn myself in, get booked and then fucking come back home and then make the town the next day. 
And that's where the first time I had to say, well, because I loved the spot I was in. And boy, those checks, right? And I'm on top in a big territory. I said, but going to jail by myself in Little Rock, Arkansas, Grizzly, being completely honest, Louisville, Kentucky is 500 miles on farther up the road, and I may just not stop in Little Rock because I was not looking forward to going to jail. He said, I'll meet you up there. So we got the day and time set up, told me where to meet him at the courthouse, the jail, whatever. I walk in there with Grizzly Smith. They took my picture. They fingerprinted me. They had to put me in a cell for while he did the work. But I'd, I'd asked Grizzly, I said, they know not to put me in a goddamn cell with just everybody, right? Because they, oh, don't worry. Because think about that. Can you imagine... I'm in the general population at the Little Rock Jail when I'm on television on Mid-South Wrestling in 1984. My, they wouldn't have been able to find my clothes <laughs> by the time I got out. Anyway, they put me in this jail cell with one other guy. And he was on the bench, the bed, whatever you call it, in a jail cell with a blanket over him from the top of his head to his ankles. The only thing that was sticking out was his feet. And I was in there for about an hour, hour and 15 minutes, and that guy never moved. And they came back out and, and came back and got me and said, okay. And they walked me to Grizzly, and we're walking out the front door. I said, what now? He said, that's it. I said, what? He said, you won't hear anything more about this. And I never did. That's a guy. <laughs> but it if went you, through him. You didn't even know yes. you had to go in. They contacted him, and he worked everything out. Well, uh, they contacted the office. Because all the cops in little, all the cops in the regular towns knew if somebody, if one of the wrestlers gets in trouble, call the office, Mid South Sports. Maybe, maybe they might have called Grizzly directly. I don't know, but it was calling the office, and then Grizzly fixed it. And I mean, there was a couple of things. We got a couple of lawsuits. There was a couple of them, but I never. Sp of all the things that we got into in that year in Louisiana, I never spent more than an hour and a half in jail. And, you know, and what a travesty Grizzly, of justice. Well, anyway, um, <laughs> and here's another thing here's the, here's the, he's the guy you looked to <clears throat> when you had a problem with anything you were being asked to do. If, Bill Dundee was the booker and you worked out with him, you know, stuff, but uh, of a employment nature, like I'm going to quit. If I have to do this, you'd go to Grizzly, right? And the time in Homa, Louisiana. It was a midnight rock and roll tag match. Jim Cornette in a straight jacket at ringside so he can't interfere. Well, this was even before that I saw eight or ten full-grown men attack Dr. Death Steve Williams and Hercules Hernandez in the Homa Rec Center with no fear of them. What's, they learned some fear. Um, Doc and Hercules against ten other guys. It was about even. Doc and Herc won. I, just, I had Dr. Death's football helmet and every time somebody got passed i'd just swing it and bean them but this was before that but we already knew homa was bad and that was the place where once you got in the locker room you had to go back out in into the building and into the people to leave the building so they when we were on last they used to lock us in this fucking concrete room 14 by 14 feet for like an hour so they could clear the building and the parking lot we that's where me and condry <laughs> got bombarded in the parking lot and the rock and roll express had to drive through the crowd to get him. So we had time to jump in our car and get away after Dennis took the one guy down. Anyway, me and Bobby and Dennis got together and said, we're going to present a United front. I cannot go out in that building wearing a straight jacket. I have to be able to, cause we don't trust the cops cause it's a spot show and the cops have to live here and I can't go out there that vulnerable. I'll get fucking stabbed or something will happen. The boys in the match, they can't concentrate if they're having to keep an eye on me. I got to have my arms free or I'm not going out there. And Grizzly said, I'll fix it. So I went out there and got put in the fucking straight jacket. My arms fucking cinched up and sat in a chair at ringside. And Grizzly Smith brought a chair and sat right behind me and put his hands on my shoulders. And that close. And because 
of who to those people Grizzly Smith was, and he was seven feet tall, 375 pounds. They had a free shot at me, and the cops couldn't have stopped him, but nobody touched me because I was sitting in front of Grizzly Smith. And that's the only way I agreed to do that deal. This is the guy that we saw, right? And then years later, you hear all it. The only thing that anybody else ever saw was, what the fuck is he? And I mean, honestly, I'm sure a lot of guys thought, well, he, this is an old man that gets a tickle out of being around these young kids, but they couldn't have dreamed the lengths that he was going to. Nobody could have, because you, like I said, baby doll says sitting in the car looking for it, can't see it. This guy deals with the cops all the time. This guy deals with all these important people. This guy's been a celebrity in this part of the country for 20 years. And he was able to keep all that shit covered up. Yeah, that's one of the important things. Until beyond the mat, and maybe some things after that, nobody knew anything about Jake's mother or the circumstances around Jake's birth. No one knew anything about Jake's sister who was murdered in, what, 79? Yeah. No one knew anything about Grizzly molesting his daughters. I mean, no one knew any of this. And then it all just came out, and... There wasn't a big backlash. I mean, Grizzly lived for another, whatever, 15 years after that. But I think lately, there, Robin started talking. There are more stories. And now, I wish there was more stuff fully explained. I wish this dark side was more fully fleshed out to explain things and to go well, into... How, but how much detail can you go into on something like that and still stay on the air and not just be a... Well, I don't, I'm not necessarily, you know, I'm not necessarily, look, I don't, I mean, one of the things I didn't like is, and I think they overdo it with the dramatizations, the dramatic takes, whatever you want to call it. I did not need to see a dramatization of Jake's sister going into an incinerator. Give me a Yeah, break. yeah. That, that, that really had no place being there. And that was really poorly thought out. And they're just doing those way too much. But what I was going to say is you could flesh out a lot of the things like who is Grizzly Smith? Why did Grizzly Smith have this power, or if power is not the right word, this sway with local authorities or whoever it may be? Explain a little bit about that. Explain a little bit about Jake's history in the business. They tried to get a well, lot into uh, 44 now, minutes or whatever it I was, was. I was about to say, let me be the defender there, because most of the comments, we talked for a long time, and I'm not aggravated about being a lot of my stuff cut out of the show because it was more important what they put in. Where was Jim Ross? Where was Jim Ross? He's on this season. Why wasn't Jim Ross talked to about this? I don't know if he wanted to touch it or not. Um, who knows? But that's one of the things that that I primarily was there to do was I went into a lot of detail in the shoot on Grizzly Smith's wrestling career and, and early days and Jake's wrestling career. We dug up. Did you know Jake broke in as referee Fred Platt? Yes, I have all those photos you got the and pictures I, right? and I have all the notes about it. And Fred Platt was one of he had another name. Also, he had two different names as a referee, but Fred Platt was one of them. Yeah. And the first time I saw Jake in and that's my point, people, whenever people met Jake, it was because he was with his dad at the yeah. show. So, I mean, no one had any idea of the the the, well, level, the, uh, hold the, on. the relationship this is this is how bad that jake hated grizzly at the time the first time i saw jake roberts in person wrestling was in 1977 when he was a rookie and his name was jake smith jr so he was hating his father as a rookie by taking his his name and the reason why they the reason why jake was became jake yes he said he his nickname was buster or whatever when he was a kid but Grizzly's real name is Aurelian Smith, and nobody could pronounce or spell or knew what the fuck was uh, was about with Aurelian. So, as a wrestler, he either used Tiny Smith or Jake Smith. Jake's an old hey Jake. It's an old fucking Southern nickname. Um, before he became Grizzly, and then when Jake started wrestling, after Fred Platt, the referee, and whatever his other name was, he became Jake Smith Jr. because that was his connection to wrestling. My father was a famous wrestler. And within, I would say, what, the first year, by the time he went to Stampede in Calgary, 78 or whatever, he was Jake Roberts. And again, he wrestled a lot in Louisiana. So, I mean, he was wrestling yeah. a lot in his dad's 
not his dad's home territory, but the territory that employed his dad. So, you know, at any rate, the, the, the point is, is that that's why I alluded to when we first started talking about the show, this was a program about a dysfunctional family that just happened to be involved in the wrestling business. And I think that they thought, and I think they were right that the personal interaction of the things that people were talking about was more important to only have 44 minutes to do it in than lengthy wrestling, you know, biographies. But it might have helped explain why Grizzly was able to get away with a lot of this. I think you just made a very fair point, and I think I would have applied that point and gotten rid of some of the dramatizations that weren't needed over <laughs> the voiceovers, but also Heroes of Wrestling wasn't needed there. There was no reason to include that there. <laughs> you want to do an episode on that? And you may not now that you're friends with Jake, but if you want to do an episode on that, <laughs> go for it. That's a great episode. But to all of a sudden, they do that too often, where they're telling a story and then all of a sudden, Let's jump ahead to this other horrible story that we only are going to show you for two minutes. And I didn't think that needed to be there at all. Well, they had to compact Jake's 15 year meltdown in public into three minutes. So that if they did the, the footage from the heroes of wrestling pay-per-view was probably the best way to do it. We can't ever say anything bad about Jake again, because he beat us all to it. He described himself in as glowing a terms as I've ever heard anybody cussed before. Um, but yeah, he you know, always knows what to say that. And well, and that's the thing. It, it, this stuff happened, no doubt about it. So has he figured out a way to turn it into something that's positive for him at the end? Possibly. Hey, speaking of positive, how about rock and Robin? How about what she's become? A lot of respect for her. She's really yeah. got her shit together. Well, you know, one, one member of the family kind of got became an adult and got straightened out and is well, the other positive, brother too you know. the brother that's not in the business he seemed like he kind of had his head okay well, yeah 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 poor guy i, I forgot him because i never knew but he existed and uh, you know as uh, he was the one that wasn't interested in wrestling and didn't want to be a public figure and he's the one that ended up having to take care of grizz but uh but yeah robin has done has done well for herself and you know obviously not only came off well but has her shit together. Um, why couldn't Sam Houston have weighed as much as he weighs now back when he was working? He, he would have made a lot more money. I thought Baby Doll was great here, too. Doll did a really good job because she was around, you know, and that's another thing. She was in the family and she couldn't figure it out. She's like, what the fuck is going on? Something's happening, but it just don't add up. And, you know, if if he had been a different type of personality in front of the boys or in front of the people, it might not have worked. But, he, I mean, you know, you would you would every once in a while you would share a laugh with Grizzly when you came. Hey, did you see what happened to Bundy or whatever? Ah, ha, ha. You know that. But normally he was all business, very straight laced, and you didn't want to get in trouble by letting Grizzly know what you were doing. If we'd have ever known that things he was doing was worse than anything we could have possibly dreamed of, right? That would have been, that would have shot everything. But uh, he, some type of psychological genius for, for just, for evil is the only way that you can wrap it up in that here was a guy that was able to present that many different personas to that many different people to get what he wanted out of them and make them like it it's amazing that that could be passed on genetically because jake ended up well, the same way I, mean, I you know there you go it's uh or, or maybe it's not passed on genetically maybe he was just the oldest and he had the most to, time to spend and learn and I'm, we're not saying that he's used it in a different way, folks. We're not saying that about Jake, but he's psychologically manipulative. Anyway, closing thoughts on this episode. Did we not cover anything that we should cover that everybody was up in arms about because they couldn't figure out what was going on? I think we covered a lot of it. You know, we've heard at various times in the last few years from people who just, they always say, how could Jim tell a story that's this, funny story and Grizzly's involved in it and he doesn't immediately point out 
You know, and Grizzly Smith was there. Uh, and by the way, Grizzly Smith was an, an incestuous child molester. But, you know, you didn't know the severity of things. Nobody did. You could make jokes. There could be lots of innuendo. It is certainly awkward as fuck that he, at that point, and I remember what he looked like on TV in 84, wore the same outfit every time we saw him. Yeah. It's weird to think that he was driving around those small roads with just random underage girls yeah. in in this car he since he spent so much time practically lived in the car it was a mess there was maps and there was papers and there was bags of food and there was everything and you know and you'd see him coming out and he dressed the same way the you know the old button down shirt with with his glasses and a pen and his cigarettes in his pocket and these giant pants that he would wear for two and three days at a time. And you, you know, uh, and, and I'll in honesty and in, in all honesty, rather, and in means of full disclosure, I knew very well one young lady that actually had made a few road trips with Grizzly and couldn't say enough good things about him. And, you know, just she would ride from Mississippi to Baton Rouge to wherever to wherever. And then same thing. Her mom knew where she was. And I knew her well enough in such a way enough that if anything had happened, it would have been mentioned. And it was just no, it's it's grizzly. Grizzly's great. He takes care of everybody. So at, at some point. I don't know exactly how to articulate this, but he might have gone from a practicing pedophile to one that just enjoyed the company, but wasn't going to go too far or knew how to pick his spots. So I'm not saying that everything he did with all of those, there was something going on with all those girls, but it was, he was getting some enjoyment out of mentoring and fostering all those girls, whether there was anything else going on or not. And it just was fucking weird. Anyway, 